Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dental CE Academy and our presentation today, Tooth or Consequences. We are running right on time. There was an email that was sent out to all of you here this morning with the handout. We'll go ahead and post that again for you in the chat area. Um, I would like to review the housekeeping for you this morning. Our CE portion will be from 8 until 10 a.m., followed by a product demonstration. That product demonstration will be from 10 to 10.30. If you have any audio or video issues, please let us know by typing in the chat area. We have moderators that are happy to help you. And I'm going to go ahead now and introduce our speakers this morning. We're starting today with Dr. Carey. He is in chemistry as applied to the study of dental caries, biofilms, and more recently, the study of secondary caries. He is also active in standards development, both internationally and nationally as the ISO convener and US chair on toothpaste, tooth bleaching products, and analytical methods for dental products, as well as US chair on oral rinses, denture adhesives, and fluoride varnish. He achieved his PhD in analytical chemistry from the American University in Washington, DC. He has contributed over 40 years of research with a professional goal to research ways for the public to achieve better oral health. In short, Dr. Cliff Carey does Carey's research. You're going to find this presentation um, to be invaluable to how you're providing care to your patients. We also have Dr. Kamisi, and he practiced general dentistry success, successfully in Ithaca, New York for 35 years before relocating to Charleston in August 2017 to join the faculty for the Medical University of South Carolina, James B. Edwards College of Dental Medicine, where he is an associate professor of restorative dentistry. He is the course director for the college's Operative II Adhesive and Aesthetic Dentistry course chair of the Oral Rehabilitation Department's Dental Materials Committee, course director of the newly created Dental Sleep Medicine Elective, the first of its kind interdisciplinary course at MUSC and past infection control officer for the college. He is currently the president of the South Carolina Dental Association, a graduate of Northwestern University Dental School. He received his Bachelor of Science in Biology at Fordham University. He is an emeritus member and master of the Academy of General Dentistry and holds fellowships in the Academy of Dentistry International, the American College of Dentists, the Pierre Fouchard Academy, I should know how to pronounce that, Fouchard, and the International College of Dentists. So we have a tremendous presentation for you this morning. I'm going to go ahead now and turn this over to Dr. Carey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good morning uh, for all of you who are on the on the West Coast and 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 here in in the East Coast as well. Today I'm going to talk about caries. I'm going to uh, I have up here a picture of uh, just a cross section of a white spot lesion, uh, an advanced one that's already into the dentin, and how that looks on a um, uh, micro CT uh, cross sectional X ray plus then a uh, picture of secondary caries. We're gonna talk about both of those as time goes on here. Okay, so a little bit uh, about this is that I haven't messed with any of the pictures and that uh, the, um, everything I'm gonna give you and especially about my research has, um, has is as accurately presented as possible. Um, I am at the University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine uh, as a professor, and so I get financial support from them and NIH, some uh, one grant from industry, and I have a laboratory foundation that funds some of my research. Um, the university tells me I'm not in conflict with, my, with anything, and the interactions that I have, you heard about with the international standards and the WHO, as well as a lot of dental manufacturers around the world uh, through my standards work. Having put that out, um, I'm just going to say the first part of this will be about um, caries and the background and what how they develop. And I'm going to focus a lot on biofilm because, because that's one of the um, um, untapped ways that we might be able to control caries. 
And then uh, some of the prevention for white spot lesions, which includes a little bit about fluoride and this disruption of biofilm. Then we'll get into secondary caries. After this part, uh, portion of my presentation, we will then talk about some of the research that I've done um, on these uh, topics, just uh, as focused for today's work. Caries, dental caries is 100% preventable. Nonetheless, uh, roughly everybody in the world, uh, by the time they've uh, reached adulthood, have had a, a, at least one caries. And this is not something I'm making up because it sounds really remarkable. It, this is um, data from the NIH in the years 2000. Given that, we have some yets. There's no formal diagnosis for caries yet. It's what dentists have to do all the time. Caries risk is also uh, evaluated. You know, we always want to talk about risk, yet there's little agreement about which factors are the most predictive. And then the caries prevention tools, patient education that we have really are three uh, at this time, patient education, fluoride therapies, and disruption of biofilm. A little history uh, from, uh, this is from 1970, 50 years ago. Uh, you could see that basically 50% or 60% of the molars for adults are, the, are where most of the caries happened. And, and you see that as somebody aged in the, at that in 1970 had achieved these different ages, the incidence rate, the percent of caries of the population just increases. It's, it's remarkable. Over the last 50 years, you can see uh, that the 1970 line is this black one, and that we've actually reduced the amount of caries by roughly 30%. Uh, by 2012. And, and those 42 years, there has been a lot that's gone on, including, um, um, and we'll get to the factors in a minute, including the reduction of the amount of edentulist people in the world. And, and, um, and so what we see here is from roughly half, this is United States data, uh, roughly half down to 13% in, in 2012. This, this, this didn't happen just by magic. Uh, there are four factors that lead to this. One of them is community water fluoridation became popular, and then also the use of fluoridated toothpaste and other fluoride therapies. So That's good, a good start. You should never ignore the fact that there's public education, and this public education has made, it, made the public aware of the importance of oral care and their oral health. And then there's uh, part of that is the public health programs that are out there. Uh, there, every state in the union has a uh, uh, varnish, the, the uh, varnish programs for uh, children. And the idea is to uh, at least be able to show um, a that we can uh, do a varnish or a sealant program, um, also uh, to protect the teeth and give them a, a, a chance as the child learns how to do better oral care. And then finally, reduction of bad habits. Cigarette smoking, for instance, has, has changed dramatically over the last 50 years. And, and so by reducing some of those bad habits, we're able to keep teeth longer. <sighs> Caries is a thing that you have to kind of think about in terms of the environment, not only the environment of what's in the mouth, but also the environment of the patient. And so this blue ring on the outside is just a way for me to try and uh, it, it let you know that as a dentist uh, and uh, dental professionals, it's really tough to work on the blue ring. We can't help with the income and stuff, but we can help with the knowledge and the attitude and even education about behavior. These are the environment in which your patient is and, and you know, the, the various different behaviors that happen between groups, peer pressure and stuff are, are, are hard to work with. And then once we get to the inside of the ring, we've got topical fluoride and then some other things that are on our side. The immune systems typically um, timed, it takes time to develop a caries. And then saliva, uh, which is a huge, huge factor in terms of whether caries develops or not. And so then that leaves us with the Venn diagram of plaque, the biofilm, the tooth itself, and there's features about teeth that um, are both good and bad. 
and then the diet that the patient has. All of these things have to be considered when you're talking about caries. The other part of it is it would be wrong not to say that caries start from basically nothing and develop over time into something that's pretty pretty remarkable and, and really tough to deal with. Um, Dr. Harold Lee used to say every implant started as a white spot. And so, you know, it's just a matter of time. And so um, uh, that's, that's the uh, perspective. And the job of the uh, dental professional is to literally extend the amount of time it takes to advance. So under normal conditions, uh, this is just what caries is, is, the tooth is in a, a more or less a steady state situation where there's demineralization that happens for a period of time. And then after the demineralization challenge goes away, the saliva uh, either neutralizes the pH or washes away, but it also provides calcium phosphate. So there's remineralization. Under normal conditions, the remineralization, demineralization uh, is balanced. Uh, when things go wrong, that balance is upset and you may have more demineralization than you have remineralization. And there's a number of factors that lead to that happening. One is poor uh, oral hygiene, which leads to high bacterial counts in the mouth and high sugar consumption, which feeds those high bacterial counts and make, generates acid. Tooth morphology. Tooth morphology is also um, a key phrase for saying tooth genetics. Some people's genetics for their teeth are, are different than others, and the enamel isn't quite the same. Uh, and so tooth morphology is actually the genetic factor is poorly understood, um, but is thought to be roughly 30% of the um, risk factors. Um, that's not agreed upon yet. Root exposure, of course, uh, when you're exposing dentin, that's a bit more um, uh, susceptible to the acids. And then if you don't have enough saliva, there's some neurostomia going on, uh, then the remineralization phase is muted. And so, of course, then demineralization becomes the predominant factor and caries happens. A little bit, it's just about what a white spot lesion looks like. The very earliest demineralization is, is this, this series of pictures. And what I've tried to show is as you go in through a white spot lesion, if you do a cross section of that tooth and make a thin slice and put it under polarized light uh, where the pink is on the outside and the blue is on the inside where the sound enamel is, the pink is on the outside of the tooth, you'll see that it's a layered um, uh, lesion. It's got a layered structure to it where the outer layer of the tooth, especially seen here, is, is, looks blue. It looks intact. And in fact, it's more mineral dense than what's going on underneath it in the body of the lesion. So just so that you have an idea of what, what I'm talking about, there's some terminology. The, that mineral dense layer on the outside of the tooth is called the intact layer sometimes. Then the body of the lesion is this orangish yellow part here that you see. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's this advancing front. You notice the pink area right here, just along the advancing front of the lesion. That's where the mineral is being dissolved. It dissolves from the deepest portion of the lesion. And then, of course, the sound enamel is on the inside. So why is this important? Well, here's what's going on. When you have an acid attack, this hydrogen ion diffusion goes into the tooth. It diffuses through the intact layer, not really getting neutralized because the intact layer is, is likely to be uh, high fluoride, uh, relatively insoluble fluoroapatite like uh, uh, surface. And so once it then passes, the acid passes into the body of the lesion, the body of the lesion has already uh, had the most soluble apatitic uh, calcium phosphate uh, minerals taken out of it. Typically, um, carbonate apatites are, diso are dissolved. Those, the, so the pH doesn't change because it's really not dissolving so much here. But when it hits to the advancing front, you see that the pH rises significantly as it's dissolving the carbonate apatite and other more soluble uh, 
minerals that, that are in the, in the enamel. Eventually, by the time you get through that, the pH has gotten to normal and there's no dissolution. So that's what's happening on the pH side. On the calcium side, the dissolved mineral side, the calcium and phosphate, it's very little in, in solution within the tooth. And then it increases rapidly as that carbonate appetite is dissolved. And um, that tends to neutralize and buffer the pH. And then the calcium and phosphate itself, but calcium in particular, passively diffuses out of the tooth. There may be some precipitation when it hits that fluoride rich layer, and then it's lost. It's lost to the tooth. It's into the saliva and washed away. A couple things to notice. The hydrogen ion, the acid attack, is the primary driving force for this lesion to occur. The rate of the lesion growth, however, happens to be the, the diffusion rate of calcium leaving the tooth. Let me say that again. Primary driving force for the lesion is acid or the hydrogen ion. The length of time it takes the tooth, the, the lesion to advance has to do with the diffusion of calcium out of the tooth. That's the rate limiting step. Now with your deep insight now into what's going on in the caries and early caries, uh, let's talk about some of the factors that lead to it. I've mentioned before, there's poor oral hygiene, poor health habits, poor dietary habits, and xerostomia. All of these are, are uh, different for different people because they, they have different habits and different, uh, different hygiene capabilities. But these are all the caries factors that we have to pay attention to. So I'm now going to say from that, that segue of four important things to, to remember about, we're going to focus on biofilm. Mostly because you've already heard about fluoride and all these other things. It's now time to talk about biofilm and understand what's going on with it. This is a picture, by the way, that I took out of a, of a, a high-rise building of a building next door to their water treatment for the, for the air water handling of the system. And there's biofilm pretty much everywhere you go. And I'm just going to say biofilm is, is one of those... Um, um, things it's not just bacteria or or fungi or uh, you know microbes floating around it's they've found a substrate to which they can attach and they start developing a microbial community and we call that dental biofilm in the case of oral stuff and so i show this cartoon just basically to help you understand that when we're talking about biofilm, we're not talking about the bacteria that are floating around and the microbes that are floating around in the saliva unattached, but we're actually taking, looking at those that have attached and as developing into a community. And that process is really, and very simply put, you have a really clean tooth. The first thing that happens when the patient closes their mouth is the proteins from their saliva start uh, coating the outside of that tooth and, and the restorations, everything, uh, all the tissues, and that we call that the dental pellicle. It starts forming, and then to that dental pellicle, some of the bacteria or microbes that have been uh, not, uh, not attached uh, find a way to attach and adhere to the tooth, typically in a crevice or someplace where there's less flow rate, and then that becomes the the nexus where uh, other bacteria can either attach to the ones that have already attached and or uh, also attach to the pellicle. The whole point being that you start getting a mixed species um, of microbes that forms this biofilm. Biofilm uh, is, is, if you studied biofilm for any length of time, you'll find out that there are roughly 900 different species of my oral microbes in each person. They're not the same for everybody. Uh, there are some that are close. Uh, there's been a total of about 1,200 different species that have been identified in various different oral biofilms. Um, most of these can't be grown in the culture in the laboratory, which means it's really tough to do a laboratory study that, that um, mimics everything that goes on in the environment of the mouth. And the properties of the microbes when they're attached to a surface um, uh, in the mouth 
are often different than the same type of biofilm that you grew in the, in the lab because the environment is different uh, and the oral environment is not steady state at all. It's always going up and down and all around. And so the bottom line is, is that um, uh, the biofilm is responsive to the oral environmental change. It's very difficult to model that in the laboratory. Philip Marsh said that the natural oral bi microbiome is not associated with oral disease. And when he said that, I asked him, I said, what do you mean? A biofilm is what creates our caries. You have to have it. And he said the natural oral biofilm that is not dysbiotic is, is just fine. You're going to have it. And it doesn't have to lead to caries. And the point there is, is that he's actually making it due to environmental pressures. It may cause the biofilm to become... Um, um, Carry, karyogenic as opposed to just being not. So dental my biofilm, some deep features about biofilms themselves. Um, they have the ability to move around. It's kind of interesting because you don't really think of biofilms as something that can move, but they're dynamic and they, and they can move through a bunch of different mechanisms. Either they uh, detach and end up going with the flow of the saliva, whether it's lost and swallowed or whether it hits another surface, it's still streaming. Um, it can also, uh, they can also spread just by simply growing, or they can actually uh, have a dispersal where certain of the bacteria are, are ejected and form new biofilms in different places. So there's lots of mechanisms by which biofilms can move around. And just if you stop and think about it, somebody brushing their teeth is running around and, and moving the biofilm around as well. Biofilm doesn't always have to be a um, uh, active system after a while. Uh, technically, dental calculus is, is, is biofilm that has been around long enough that the um, environment has made it such that the calcium phosphates are, are start accumulating within the a thick biofilm that now kills the biofilm you end up with a hard tissue uh, a hard surface of calcium phosphates and and basically that's your your dental calculus i thought i'd put a picture of this in here just to show you that there's a bunch of different calcium phosphates that come along but eventually it becomes apatitic it takes time Biofilms are different because there's, they, they act as a community. And so with, within a community, the, there's cell-cell signaling where some of the bacteria might, might under a certain uh, stimulus in the environment, might start um, sending out a signal, uh, either whether it's a, um, a compound or, or some, some waste product or something that is then circulates around and other cells within the system pick that up. And so there's basically a, a um, communication system. And this is really general. It uh, doesn't have specific examples for that. But these, some of these uh, actual communications are able to exchange genetic information. And I wanted to just say that there's these three that are here are well-known um, uh, a, a ability to, to move genetic material from one to the other. And this leads to something that we can call quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is sort of a, a bigger term than just those three that I pointed out. The bottom line is, is that what you get with quorum sensing is sharing of the genetic, genetic information, which is picked up by other cells. And this is one of the most... Uh, um, uh, studied mechanisms for how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. Uh, for instance, if a particular bacterium within their species within a biofilm has the ability to be resistant to a particular antibiotic, sometimes that DNA gets shared and picked up by a, a different species, and then that DNA becomes active there and thereby accumulating or acquiring the ability to have resistance to antimicrobials. So with quorum sensing, I just couldn't help but think, you know, we always talk about the new math, 
Well, quorum sensing is literally the biological math where one and one does not necessarily equal two. And uh, with that thought in mind, understanding that that's all because of biofilm community that we're talking about. So uh, that my, my, my cartoon guy is, uh, are you going to join the resistance is a really good question and uh, we'll go from there. So just going back for a step or two to tell you that the planktonic bacteria that is floating around in the, in the, in the solution would actually be more susceptible to antimicrobial chemicals because they're in the solution too. Um, many of the, uh, of the infections plaguing humans are actually caused by biofilm rather than plantonic, plantonic uh, bacteria. And the biofilm is harder to attack with the antimicro antimicrobials. And uh, often you will even hear descriptions of how a biofilm resisted an antimicrobial because the top cells died and became an insulation layer, keeping the antimicrobial from actually getting in. So the antimicrobials uh, research on this is really difficult. And I just want to point out that um, the, I remember I said that what happens in a Petri dish uh, biofilm versus what happens in the mouth are not the same. And that just raises a huge, huge challenge for being able to have an in vitro test that goes uh, and is very predictive for in vivo. It's a challenge for researchers like me. And so um, uh, there are new classes of antibiotics that are coming along. And uh, some of those are, are attached to the surface and maybe they can help keep biofilm from actually attaching. I show you this ecological hypothesis about biofilm for one purpose, and that is to show you that, uh, you know, in the dysbiotic state, there's sugar intake, increased metabolism, decreased um, uh, metabolism of the, the um, uh, commensal bacteria that are there, the non-dangerous ones, and increased bacterial load. Each one of these are interruptible for the prevention of caries uh, progression. And so given that, um, you know, how do you deal with it? And in some cases, a lot of this increased bacterial load is interruptible and the metabolism even um, simply by some of the new approaches that we've been taking. Fluoride doesn't necessarily do all of these things. And so the antimicrobial approach might be important. The other thing is, is that biofilms um, can be transmitted. And uh, basically, um, this is an excuse for me to show my uh, picture of my grandchild. But the bottom line is, is that the, um, at one point we thought that it was thought that the bacteria are transmitted from mother to child um, because they share uh, uh, spoons. Um, it turns out that in the United States, it's more uh, horizontal that it's with a lot of children in, in uh, preschool and daycare that they share toys and and that back and so basically we we then go and blame the caregivers and we say the caregivers are the ones who um, oversee what a child does. Um, the bottom line is the biofilm itself can move uh, laterally, uh, not necessarily only generationally. So that's, that's my intro on biofilms. Now what I want to, want to do is switch over and tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing, uh, specifically, not everything, but the ones about uh, biofilm, biofilm control, and, and some clinical trials uh, assessing how well that, these are working. So wanting to understand the caries process, wanting to understand biofilms and their effects on restorations, uh, which is um, sometimes not talked about as, as much as it needs to be, and preventing biofilm attachment. And then the final one that I'm going to um, talk about a little bit is secondary caries. So to do any research on biofilms that is relevant, you need to have some sort of a model. Uh, and I, I refer to it as a model mouth or a model system that at least models something 
associated with the oral environment. And this is one system that I started out with many years ago um, that, that basically use pumps to, to uh, pump saliva-like solution across the sample and the sample was stirred in here. Each of these samples was seeded with um, strep mutans. And so the, they were taken out of the, the flow of solution on a, uh, two or three times a day and put into um, uh, um, a sugar or uh, to feed the bacteria. And then um, we tested different solutions of food on the growth and demineralization of the enamel. In particular, we were looking at raisin juice. And raisin juice is interesting because raisins are always thought to be healthy. Um, but is is how what what's its cariogenic potential? And that was our question. So what we did was we we made a ten percent um, by weight raisin juice, and we flooded the system with those samples that have strep mutans growing on them um, periodically. And and you see that we ran this for ten days, and this is the uh, x-rays of the sample uh, over those 10 days, just each of these. And these are the lines showing the mineral density going on. What we found was very interesting. We, we checked with a couple controls, whole milk and saliva-like solution. And after 10 days, there was basically no change in the, um, no demineralization, no real remineralization. The raisin juice itself was compared to orange juice and orange juice seemed to be more aggressive than raisin juice. And raisin juice has pH that was only slightly higher uh, than the orange juice. But the raisin juice uh, is a more complicated system in terms of the kinds of acids that are there. Then what we did is we added a part per million of fluoride to the raisin juice to see if that would make much difference. And as you see, it basically didn't make that much difference in, in, the, in the total amount of um, depth of lesion that, was, that we were talking about. And, and our, our later, when we actually tested the raisin juice itself, we found that raisins have two part two ppm of fluoride in them to begin with, raisins do. And so when you dry them out, there's a higher concentration of of fluoride in raisins than one would expect. And that's why we see the difference between orange juice and raisin juice. So that was a early testing many years ago. We learned a lot about how to test things and how to measure. And we also learned that, um, you know, with, when you want to go to a mixed system, it was really difficult to grow a mixed biofilm on that very small uh, surface area of our samples. So we came up with a different method for uh, getting biofilm, just to test, test for uh, attachment of biofilm to various substrates. And as you can see, it's just a very laboratory-based system where we took a substrate. It might have been hydroxyapatite, could have been enamel, could have been something coating those, and uh, put them in a four, um, four multi-species biofilm. Uh, to and then change that. And so we did this for 48 hours. Then after the time's up, you you um, sonicate to remove the biofilm from the from the surface of the of the substrate and mix it up into sterile saline and then plate it. And we re re redo the extraction. We call this the extraction steps. We, re we redo the extraction until there's no um, nothing grows on our plates. So we, and then we just add those together. So what we have here is some outcomes of, you know, what does the substrate matter in terms of attaching either single species strep mutans or multi-species, these four guys. And uh, just in the single species, uh, enamel, enamel with uh, pellicle hydroxyapatite, uh, composite with pellicle. Um, hydroxyapatite with fingernail polish on it. And I use fingernail polish to, to keep um, portions of a tooth protected. And it turns out fingernail polish is actually really good at supporting bacterial attachment. And then a composite, just this. The short message of this graph here is that looking at the green, um, green bars, 
is that if it's a polymer, like a composite or fingernail polish, it supports attachment of biofilm much, much better than, than the natural surfaces, the hydroxyapatite and the enamel. Going over to the multi-species system, we see the same thing. Uh, for the most part, the composite has the most. Then, then we go to hydroxyapatite with pellicle, enamel with pellicle, and hydroxyapatite without. And you see that, that these are all attachable to the multi-species, which says that right there, that they're, they've already changed their, their capability to attach uh, associated with the community of the biofilm as opposed to a single, multi single species. Draw your attention down here to amalgam. Um, we know amalgam releases some silver ions slowly, and it's somewhat antimicrobial. And then I have polymethyl methacrylate. We looked at this. We, this is a polymer, we, and it's associated with composites. And we looked at this a little more carefully and discovered that, in fact, when we cured our, our substrates, that we did not, in fact, remove to polymerize all of the methyl methacrylate. Methyl methacrylate is well known to be toxic um, to bacteria as well as even um, uh, other just toxic. And so here you see the effect of something that has a, a antimicrobial effect and, and it shouldn't be called polymethyl methacrylate, but polymethyl methacrylate with contamination of leftover methacrylate. What this whole series of experiments tells us is that the substrate does matter and that sometimes the bacterial, the biofilm will actually succeed on the substrate better than on the uh, uh, polymer substrate than the tooth. But we didn't like the system that well because we couldn't test um, for an overall biofilm that where you can't grow uh, uh, where remember that more than half of the bacteria in the mouth can't be cultured. So we want it to be able to go a little further than that. So we devised a system that has this, this uh, uh, support for little disks of whatever our substrate is going to be. And we can put all of them different ones in there and some of them treated and some of them not. And so there, everything receives the same um, um, exposure this, uh, to whole saliva in this particular case. What we did is we took saliva, we centrifuged it to take out the clumps of dead things and food particles or anything that might be there and just use the whole saliva, which we changed out um, daily um, in a incubated system where we rotated, gently agitated the system so that there was a flow across the surface, basically to keep things from the, the free floating bacteria from just floating down to the surface and, and somehow uh, just becoming part of the biofilm when it really isn't, it's just the, it's not. So we then take that out of the tube, so uh, put the tubes into a, a transfer, each of the little pellets into a, um, uh, 96 well plate and use what's called the MTT dye, which is a, a system that actually tells you what the metabolism rate is doing of the biofilm that you've, that you've got. And then you transfer, after you treated them with the dye, you transfer a certain amount of that uh, dye solution and then let it de develop properly and determine the absorbance uh, in the regular spectrophotometer. And what we found is pretty interesting is that you can, uh, well, I'll get back to that, but this has the, the um, standard curve built in right here. And you can see that there was different, different intensities of absorbance uh, that you can see right here, just of the showing different amount of metabolism going on. So this now leads me to some research that we did using something called K18, it's a quaternary uh, quaternary amine uh, system based on the silane uh, with the with the branches coupled off of it. Um, and what uh, we did was we made that into a UDMAH uh, HEMA um, sealant and uh, was able to get use this to actually keep the 
active antimicrobial K18 as part of the polymer backbone so that it wouldn't diffuse away from the, from the sealant. It's always there. And so this is, this is just a little close-up of that um, so that you can actually see the structure. And it's this, these parts here are right here and here are what made to, uh, bound to the backbone of the polymer. In the lab, we took this and we said, okay, let's just see how well the, how, how much that affects the metabolism. And so we treated the, we made surfaces with this sealant, with uh, the K18 and without the K18. And for our 48 hour multi-species system, you see that we reduce the amount of metabolism significantly by a factor of about five. And so we reran these same experiments um, with some new samples and, and used whole unfiltered saliva, just like I'd mentioned in the other, other thing. And we, here we reduced the, the um, metabolism of the whole biofilm by more than 50%. That's a pretty big, important thing that says that maybe we should test this further. So we did. We went to the orthodontic department at the university and we found people who were treatment planned to have three or four um, uh, premolars extracted as part of their treatment plan. And we approached those people and asked if we could um, treat the surface of the tooth and, with the sealant and uh, either the K18 containing sealant or the one that doesn't or a control and, and glue on to those four teeth a, a um, um, a, a Kaplan hook, which is basically a round hook that doesn't poke into the gen, uh, into the buckle um, surfaces, and and it allows for bacterial accumulation, biofilm accumulation around the the the, the bracket. So then, when they came back, uh, the, they they would get scheduled to have their teeth extracted for their other treatment, and we would ask the um, surgeon to please keep the teeth for us and we would get those back into the laboratory. We analyzed those with the canary system, which uh, some of you may be aware of. It's a um, caries detection system that is uh, actually quite good at being able to see through composites. And also uh, uh, in our laboratory, we've, we've been able to dis, uh, to demonstrate that it's really good at being able to pick up early demineralization, those early white spot lesions. They might not even be all that visible at the time. So we took it to the lab and we subjected it to this kind of, of uh, analysis for white spot lesions. And in a very general, quick way to put it out is we had a control uh, system that did not have the UDMA or the K18. And the control system at the, at the end, in a canary system, a, a number, a canary number of around 35, is a advancing white spot lesion. Uh, it's it's advanced uh, pretty far. A 30 is just the the the, the um, UDMA itself, and you see that it was somewhat less than the control. And then looking at the K18 with the UDMA, we have a, a much less white spot development. Um, white spots are not on the canary system. Um, the rule of thumb is you look at, at numbers above 20 as beginning to get white spot lesions. And so there's some indication that in some cases there was some. So the statistics on that's really simple. Um, it's We did a paired difference. Uh, each person had um, the experimental K18 the UDMA control, as well as a um, the the third control the, with nothing, but I'm not going to call it nothing. It had a sealant over it, but it was adhesive, just basic adhesive. So everybody had their own, all, each person had each of these. And so that's a split mouth design, which is very powerful because now we can say with less number of, of patients involved in the system, we can actually look and see that you have um, statistical significance in the difference between the K18 
versus the control, the K18 versus the UDMA, statistically significant, and the UDMA itself versus the control, not so significant. Um, the power calculated for that is pretty good. And so we see that we got a 24 to 34% reduction in white spot lesion formation with the K18 versus the control on the UDMA. Let me put that into perspective. Toothpastes, when you brush your teeth, um, are claimed to be able to reduce caries by 25% in children and 24% in adults. So it's on par with um, toothpaste in particular. That's just a comparison. So we also said, well, wait a minute, we want to look at biofilm itself. Uh, instead of only looking at white spot lesions, which is the end product of, of biofilms, let's look at the biofilms themselves. And so what we did is we, we um, recruited people in the orthodontic, patients in the orthodontic department to join our study. And all we had to do was do a plaque disclosure before we started. And we used the GC triplaque ID gel, which gives you um, three colors or no color. And bottom line is, is the light blue and the purple are the more karyogenic uh, mature dental plaque and the more karyogenic dental, uh, dental plaque um, biofilms versus the pink, which is new stuff growing. It's not all that karyogenic yet or nothing. And so we've got this, this index basically that goes from three being pretty bad to zero being no dental plaque. And what we did with those people was we scored their teeth uh, three to three and each quadrant, both upper and lower, were randomly chosen to receive the K21 um, painted onto those three teeth versus the solvent that the K21 on the opposite arch, uh, opposite side of the arch. And so every, all four arches were, were treated and each person was their own control again because of split mouth, because the K21, once it's dried, uh, doesn't diffuse away from the teeth. And so our, our outcome is really nice. Um, this is the change in frequency. We just counted the amount of teeth that had the surfaces that we had. We had four surfaces per tooth that we counted. We added them all up. And you see that this, there was a negative in the frequency of the, from the beginning to the, uh, to the recall uh, a month later, that, we could, that in the K21, we, we, we had a change in frequency of more than 20 uh, lost number threes, uh, 15 lost number twos, an increase of ones, and the zeros stayed about the same. So we didn't eliminate the biofilm, but we changed its characteristic from karyogenic to non-karyogenic. Same for the lower jaw, um, we, we saw this. The placebo also had a beneficial effect in, in this case and in this case. And what we actually recognize is that once you enroll somebody into this kind of a study, they're going to brush their teeth a little bit better all the way. And so indeed what we had was improved oral care along with the K21 effect of making it harder for the biofilms to attach. So my last few minutes, I'm going to talk about secondary caries. 60% um, of all restorations placed today are replacements for existing restorations. I can't remember where I saw that, but I do know that it, um, it came from a reasonable source. It might have been one of the insurance companies. Anyhow, secondary caries, uh, which you could also call demineralization in close proximity to a restoration, um, is, 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 is one way of talking about it. For people to actually diagnose it, it, the staining in close proximity of a restoration, possibly that marginal gap appearing, you see that brown stain around the, that, that might be an indication of secondary caries. Part of the reason why 60% are done is that there's a misdiagnosis. Sometimes that stain is so compelling that it looks like there must be secondary caries. And the only way to find out is to remove the restoration and see and then uh, replace it. And sometimes there wasn't a secondary caries. 
And then finally, this last one, and I'm not trying to be mean about it, but when you change providers, sometimes the new provider takes a look at uh, a tooth, sees a restoration, sees some staining around it, doesn't have much in the way of the history of how long it's been there and such. And it's sometimes thought of as a, a reasonable thing to just go and make sure it's not a secondary caries that could lead to the loss of a tooth. So what is a secondary caries? I've got this example here that I came up with um, when I cut up a, uh, I, was, I was dissecting teeth looking for a good secondary caries that I could do some, uh, just to understand what's, what's going on. And so in this particular case, you see there's enamel and then a composite. And in this particular one, uh, by the way, uh, I don't know who placed this. This was a tooth I just gathered from, from the clinics. Um, there was some marginal gaps. These look like gaps and it probably is more like unfilled resin uh, from the liner that might have been put in before this was done. The particular dentist would have cleared out all of the existing uh, decay, maybe not underneath all the way as deep into the dentin, um, because at one time uh, people were, and there's still debate about this, I'm not going to weigh in one way or another, that you don't have to remove all of the, the demineralized area under the lesion. All you have to do is clean up the, 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 what's going on at the top and then seal this in. Um, the outer lesion is up here, and then during the, during the time that we developed the wall lesion, it was developed in this case. And so this is what a secondary caries kind of looks like. Um, there's a lot of differences in terms of the dentin part of this. Sometimes dentists will go through and clear it all out, and you won't necessarily see this demineralized area. Using this as a background, um, one of the questions is, is, well, what causes the secondary dentin? And so the lesion at the margin of an existing restoration, we talked about that. Um, it's also by Yvonne Muir uh, said it is a primary caries that happens to be at the margin of an existing restoration. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, it might be just that same caries continuing. This definition begs a lot of questions. Why, why does the caries occur at the margin of an existing filling, especially when the placement of the restoration removes the active caries, coats the tooth co co structure with adhesive, and places inert material inside the tooth? Boof, it should be sealed up. And then, uh, interestingly, why don't fluoride therapies, the standard ones, why don't they work to arrest the onset of caries? These are questions that are still being asked and we're still researching. So there's a couple theories on how um, secondary caries can happen. Uh, first one is that the biofilm itself, which has been recognized as being required for secondary caries, produces acid. Those hydrogen ions then can migrate via proton hopping mechanism where the migrate, it's not the diffusion of hydrogen ions going all the way through, but rather Hydrogen ions starting out on the outside, acidifying, and then that charge moves all the way through until it reaches a place of highest chemical reactivity, say the margin. And then it reacts with the dentin, starts dissolving that dentin down through the tooth and into the, into the more receptive, um, uh, higher chemical reactivity area. That's one. Or two, is a hydrogen ion is generated along the margin of restoration by surviving microbes that were embedded into the wall when you made the preparation. And the, those bacteria were sealed into place, yes, but they don't necessarily die. They go into stasis until their environment changes, and then they can start metabolizing again if food comes around. It takes time, and well, we know secondary caries do take time. So is it one or the other, or maybe, honestly, probably both? So that's, those are the two theories of mechanisms. And so in my lab, I tried setting together a model mouth system that literally tried to emit, provide the acid that the, the bacteria would have provided. And so that's my biofilm is the acid I'm providing into the system. I have a in this flow through system, 
where saliva is pumped across the sample, acid comes in from time to time, and we just simply put a, uh, some teeth in this system that had restoration. We took a, a healthy tooth that had been extracted for other reasons, probably orthodontic reasons. We drilled holes in it and filled it. Uh, and I didn't do it. I had a, uh, one of our clinicians do the filling, uh, adding the restoration and curing it. And so what we found was very interesting. Um, this is, again, where I used the canary system. I mentioned it could see through the lesion. So, again, I used that. And I used the canary lab in this particular case. And what that does is it scans an area of the tooth. This is the area here is where the restoration is. These are fiduciary markers markers over here. Uh, so we lined it up properly before, during, and after. And you can see that the blue is um, area is not, not demineralized. There's some demineralization through the others, but it's not terrible. This is what it looked like afterwards. If you subtract one from the other, you'll see that this area of the tooth was getting demineralized over 30 days of that cyclic acid and saliva experience. And so I cut it open and we take a look at this. this. These three pictures are the same slice of tooth, just with different lighting. This is lighting from above. And you can see that there's the, um, um, a very different uh, look to, to the restoration. And this white area is showing the, the mineral being dissolved away and it turns white. In the polarized light of that very same thing, you see that the polarized, the, the dark area is where the demineralization is occurring. And we're looking for lesions along the wall here, and I don't see any. And then down here, uh, this is a, where the light is being sh shown through the system. Again, we see the demineralization area. We clearly see what the restoration looked like, complete with the pocket of, of unfilled um, resin. And some demineralization on the outside. Yes, this was not there when we started. And so there's that, you can see up here, that same demineralization, and it's still up here and here. And so we did have demineralization of the surfaces and beginning to establish another lesion alongside, outside of the restoration. But the bigger piece of information was that we got much more demineralization deep within the lesion, below the restoration. So... I'm going to stop right there, and I know you're going to have questions, and there's going to be some time for questions and answers after um, John uh, Kamisi presents his information. Um, but there's his, my email right here that you can always send me uh, questions to. I show you this slide only to remind you that the mouth is attached to the rest of the body. Good oral health and the oral health of the mouth has an effect on systemic health. I want to thank, thank you, you Dr. Carey. And I'm going to unshare. I think terrific. Is, how do I unshare? Uh, it uh, looks like you have unshared. Okay. Yep. Good. At least you're not there. So you're there, <laughs> but your presentation looks like it has gone. And we have Dr. Kamisi right now. Excellent so I want to remind everyone, yes, excellent presentation. I want to remind everyone that um, if you have questions, please be sure to type them into the chat area. There will be a Q&A with both Dr. Carey and Dr. Kamisi. And now it's my pleasure to hand this over to Dr. Kamisi. Do you want to hit the um, presenter's view? Uh, did I not do that already? I'm not. I'm seeing your thumbnails on the side. Okay. It's always fun when presentations work as well as they do. How's that? This is going swimmingly. Oh, I think we're 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 still seeing the thumbnails, but I'm okay with that. Um, okay. Do you see any movement of the slides at all? No. All right. Let's try one more thing because we can't. <laughs> there we go. Now you're moving. All right, now I'm moving. Now you're All right. moving. All right, do you um, see them? But we still see the the uh, slides on the left hand side. All right, let's try one more thing. If you go up, Janet. Yeah, go up to the upper slideshow option on your tabs up above. 
Next. Yeah. Hang on a sec. Say that again. Where it says slideshow up on the tabs, it has home insert. There's a slideshow. You click on that, it'll say start from the beginning. There'll be an icon. Okay. Maybe I can do that. Let's try that. Let's see if that works there. Nope. Is that, is that not doing anything? No. No. Now okay. it is. Perfect. Got it now? All right. Yes. Excellent. Thank you all. All right. Technology. Thank you so Technology much. Technology is always so much fun, folks. Thanks so much for bearing with me while we Especially go Especially in live. Thank you, Dr. Kamisi. We'll <laughs> hand over welcome. the virtual podium to you. Thank you so much. And again, Cliff, an incredible lecture. Every time I get to hear you speak, I learn so much more. So thank you. Uh, in this aspect, I'm going to take a little bit more of a clinician's approach to it. And as a clinician, I'm also a, an avid reader of the research. And many of the things that you are going to be talking about are the are from research that I've seen and my own challenges as we go forward. And as you can see in this particular slide, we have several failing restorations. And these are failing restorations that I placed at one point in time. The amalgam is doing pretty darn well, but my composites absolutely are horrific. And this was my beginning journey to try to find ways to improve the restorative process. Um, and this was back in my private practice uh, many years ago. Uh, looking at conflict of interest, I have none. Uh, basically, uh, all the photographs are used by me are not changed in any way because I don't know how to use Photoshop. So they're all going to be there. And any, any funds are from an educational funding from Fight Back Dental for this presentation. Now, if we go back into the history of restorative mechanisms, especially for composites, which is the realm that I live in on a day-to-day -day basis at the college, uh, we look at what Michael Bonacar did and what Ray Bowen did, and of course, Nagabayashi, who, was the, uh, who identified the hybrid layer along with David Pashley as to what we use today, this form of tissue engineering that we're attempting to try to create when we have the decayed and damaged structure that Cliff so beautifully described in this presentation. And our ultimate goal in this micrograph by my good colleague and good friend, uh, Umar Daoud, shows the process of trying to create this resin tags deep with inside the tooth in the dentin area uh, that sometimes uh, may not work as well as we want to because the literature continues to show that we have high failure rates. Our dentin bonding procedures uh, don't have a long-term uh, residual benefit. Uh, NIDCR uh, has shown us that the average lifespan for replacing composites is approximately 5.7 years, which is extraordinarily short in comparison to restorative materials like amalgam. Um, and the problem is that we are trying to bond into dentin. And dentin in its mineralized state and its demineralized state become two different items. And if you don't demineralize them effectively, uh, you're not going to get any kind of adherence into the uh, tubular and the peritubular structure. As you can see here, it's kind of like a sponge. It needs to be able to penetrate into that in order for a restorative process to actually do something. The unfortunate problem is that there's other life inside of that. We have the odontoblastic processes, et cetera, that are there and are continuing to be alive. And we can't cover them effectively uh, with our processes because they're just going to be in the way. And, you know, the hybrid layer degradation, as this article points out, is primarily because of one of the most challenging things is the acidic nature of our materials. This article by Leo Teradine and, and group shows a really interesting process in that the dentinal caries erosion and hybrid layer formation have one thing in common, demineralized dentin, which is what we need to enable a bonding process to occur. So in a, in a caries and an erosive process that leads to disease, but in adhesive dentistry, it theoretically leads to successful bonding. But unfortunately, our BIS-GMAs and our materials are all derived from meth methacrylic acid and, B and bisphenol A. So these acidic materials are constantly challenging uh, the process. And as Cliff was talking about, the acidic nature of the hydrogen ions 
is creating some of the, our own problems that we're looking at. And in the proton hopping situation, and because of the overall uh, adherence of the bacteria to the plastic materials, we have a constant challenge going on. So the problem with our dental restorations, and I borrowed this from our last presentations by Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Tay, the, our restorations only last a few years because of bacterial accumulation that either beneath the restoration or on top of it. And these bacteria that are left behind during the restorative process can contribute to the gaps in the restoration material over time. And they can build up, cause additional damage to the tooth structure around and beneath this doctor, as Cliff just showed us a few moments ago. And these are some uh, graphic micrographs of bacteria inside of the dental tubules. And these are not unlike the, the uh, photos that were shared by Dr. Tay uh, the last time that we were together. And as the destruction continues to progress further and further in, we then have a continued problem on the overall destruction and degradation of our restorative processes. And this article uh, that was really a pretty cool one that I read many years ago, talk called The Amazing Odontoplast Activity, Autophagy and Aging, talks about the defensive mechanism of the odontoblast and the overall uh, t t uh, processes that are present there. We're trying to reduce the bacterial uh, egression, ingression into the tooth. But the question I always had was, and then that the pterodyne and everybody's looking at is that, how does the tooth differentiate between the acids of the bacterial onslaught and the demineralization associated with that and our restorative processes using the various acid materials that we use, which is what we're supposed to be doing. And as Cliff was also talking about, the tooth and the enamel being a semi-permeable membrane with a constant flow of fluids and other ion transfer because of that hydrogen ion influx that is continually trying to damage the tooth. So we have a lot of, lot of challenges. And as Dr. Tay showed us in the last presentation, there is this also this constant flow of fluid through the dental tubules that also are important to re reduce and remove the noxious materials that are there from that attack of the caries bacteria. Uh, and also to try to clear things from the overall getting to into the pulp chamber region. But unfortunately, um, it, it becomes a problem in that it affects our bonding process because the water, the moisture can move through the adhesives. There's been many, many, many articles on this process. And even though our bonding uh, agents are supposed to be hydrophobic, over the course of time, we see that they do become hydrophilic. This great an uh, article by Anna Cesandaro, a good friend of mine from Portugal, shows that all simplified adhesives will behave as a permeable membrane. And if all of the exposed collagen is not encapsulated, as has been talked about by Tay and Pashley for a lot of years, we're going to have breakdown. And that's how we're supposed to be solving this problem. But unfortunately, the science shows us that because of the, the hydrolyzation of these bonds, whether they're in uh, BIS-GMA or TEG-DMA, there's always going to be a breakdown because of this moisture flow. We have to stop that fluid. And also, the water present within the collagen fibrils that are there activate the matrix metalloproteinases that are, are also part of the breakdown of all of the restorative processes that we do. And again, the various types of MMPs that are there and how they break things down is, you know, very clearly been documented. And the breakdown of the collagen fibrils is a three-dimensional breakdown, which is, as a clinician, when you remove an amalgam, sometimes you need an atomic bomb to remove that last pulpal layer of amalgam that's on the pulpal floor. But as a composite restoration removal, it's sometimes when you touch it with the uh, with your handpiece, the composite goes flying across the roof. So much for our adhesive properties and processes that go on. So again, as I mentioned earlier, and as Anna talked about in, in her article, you increase the durability if all of the exposed fibrils, collagen fibrils, are enveloped in the resin. But unfortunately, that is not possible because there's always some moisture present someplace. 
And in the current methodology that we're using, we fail time and time again. Annalisa Mazzoni and the Brushy group have shown that the endogenous enzymes that we use uh, that it, when we use in our bonding process that remain entrapped in the hybrid layer during resin infiltration process and the acidic bonding agent themselves, irrespective of whether it's selfish adhesive or total etch type of a situation, activate these endogenous pro protease uh, preforms all of the time. So no matter what we do, I've had arguments with clinicians and other lecturers over the course of the time claiming that self-etch is, is gentler and didn't do the same thing as total etch. This article basically shows and will show that there is a breakdown no matter what, because everything we've talked about up until this point has shown that we have a failed process because of the acidic attack from our restorative materials. And again, this wonderful zymograph also from that article shows the attack of the overall uh, proteolytic enzymes are green in this micrograph. The hybrid layer, which is the dividing point between the actual resin itself and the dentin, you can see the activation that's going on. So, and also many of our composite materials have no buffering capability to try to overcome this acidic degradation. And unfortunately, that leads to a higher susceptibility of composites to the secondary caries process that Cliff very beautifully described. So we go back to my slide, my patient, my frustration, and probably many of yours as well. You want these things to work, you want these things to last, but unfortunately, up until now, we really have had few great things. And some of this, there's some processes and problems that go on in here. We have to note that Bonding to caries affected dentin is significantly problematic. Uh, all of our bonding agents, when we get the manufacturers telling us the overall shear bond strength or the megapascals, are all done on caries free surfaces. But in reality, when you, we are bonding it into caries affected dentin, we have a very, very low opportunity for really good bonding processes to occur because of the composite, that hydrolysis that we talked about and the overall enzymatic breakdown that is occurring on a regular basis. And as Cliff talked about just a few moments ago, the bacteria does have a very high affinity to the plastic surfaces of all of our composite materials. And it shows also that this, the acids in the oral biofilm that Cliff talked about negatively affects the bond strength of all self-etchant adhesive systems. And also, interestingly enough, the bacteria are digesting or using the BIS-GMA and is able to degradate it pretty easily as compared to some of the other materials that, uh, that Cliff showed us in his presentation as well. So we do have a significant problem. Bonding techniques are also extraordinarily sensitive to your technique itself. If you do not have a pristine process, you're going to have a problem. And I know some clinicians out there that I've talked to over the years have restorations that have lasted a longer time period than the 5.7 year average. That's because they're taking process and steps to a higher degree than unfortunately a lot of clinicians may be able to do or actually have time to do. So we do have to keep that in mind that if any of these techniques, any of these steps aren't followed exactly, the likelihood of failure, unfortunately, is quite high. Isolation before preparation, I can't get that through to my students enough. We have to make this mission critical. In my practice, I was sloppy and I admit to it. That slide of those teeth probably occurred because of my sloppy technique back in my days of early practice. I got better, but still, not everybody recognizes that. And some people think that having to replace the restorations on a regular basis is uh, possibly good for business. But I have a big, high integrity challenge whenever I talk to colleagues that talk about that. And also your lights. If you're not testing your lights regularly, if you're not aiming the beam properly. If one of the LED diodes is out, 
and you don't know about it, your cure for your composite restorations are also going to be problematic. So you do need to look at it. And most important, the human factor, if we're not looking, if we're not using shields to protect our eyes from what we're doing, uh, when you're clinically curing these items, it does become an issue. Which leads us to antimicrobials. And again, there's a big buzz about antimicrobials and antimicrobials are been looked at and desired for such a long time. We've been using various types of antimicrobials in our practices for years. We've used gluma, uh, glutaraldehydes, we've used uh, chlorhexidines. All of these have been part of the staples of what we do in our private practices and in our, even in our clinics for a long time. And we use these various products in our dental clinics up until about a year ago. And I'll explain to you what we did and why we did that in, in a couple of minutes. And interestingly enough, in order for these materials to really work in a long lasting modality, they must become part of the methacrylate structure of the substances that we apply to them. But unfortunately, they do not. They are not methacrylate based. But John, methacrylates are problematic in whatever we do. Yes, but if we're going to be using these items to be antimicrobial, and we're going to try to bond to them, how is that happening? And also, they work in a burst release mode. That means that as soon as you apply them, a lot of it dissipates into the oral cavity, and then after a period of time, is no longer present and ready to be available at a later time period when most of our restorations fail. Chlorhexene, of course, has been one of the biggest things that we love to use. You know, it cleans, it disinfects, it inhibits MMPs, at least for a period of time. It, studies have shown that it really doesn't give us the long lasting benefit that we would like to. It's kind of a static attachment to the tooth structure that dissipates after a relatively short period of time. It's been the gold, gold standard uh, for so many years because of its capability of destroying the bacteria on contact. But the bond strength after six months has been reported to be lowered as time goes by. And in fact, in this article, we find out that over in over 200 in vitro and in situ studies over the last 15 years, only a few clinical studies with follow-up of over two years have ever been published. And the clinical studies have not reported any benefit from using chlorhexidine as an MMP inhibitor, which is one of the reasons we stopped using it in our clinics at the university. Glutaraldehyde washes are really been used a lot as well. And if you look at the composition of these materials, it's 35% HEMA, 5% glutaraldehyde, and 60% water. Now we were just talking about water being part of the problem with our, especially our enzymatic breakdown that occurs. And yes, it will kill bacteria on contact and it will help to try to occlude the dental tubules, uh, coagulating the proteins. And, but unfortunately it's very caustic to the soft tissue. The HEMA also improves the wettability and diffusion of the demineralized collagen materials, but the hydrophilicity of that it leads to increased water uptake over time. So even our glutaraldehyde washes are problematic. And they are also known to, you know, inactivate the uh, enzymatic breakdown. But as the dentinal fluids that we've talked about a little earlier, slowly and continually replace it with fresh dentinal fluid, it's basically, it creates a transudate from the pulpal capillaries. And over the course of time, it becomes a transiently inactivating capability uh, rather than a long-term benefit of using the glutaraldehydes. Again, evidence-based. We have to use evidence in our clinics and this evidence show that glutaraldehyde is not an effective agent in composite bonding. So we know that they fade out over time with the current materials that you and I have been using for years. Long-term exposure, may have undesired side effects, such as potentially changing the flora uh, or becoming toxic to the environment. And the bacteria, as Cliff pointed out, via the quorum sensing and other DNA and other genetic transfer may develop a resistance by adapting to the chemicals as they are released. Bacteria are pretty darn smart. 
uh, smarter than we thought. We can't just fool them. And that leaching into the oral cavity becomes something that I grow concerned with as I do the work that we do. So the search is on for something that's going to help us in our clinical capability to create some resistance to the resist resistant bacteria. And that's where quaternary ammoniums were developed and are used in some form or another. Now, these have the features of uh, basically being able to disinfect. And it's well-known medicated mediated agents as a surfactant. Two types of quaternary ammoniums have been investigated for dental capability, the methacrylates and the silane methacrylates. We'll talk about both of those so that this way you can get a better understanding of the direction that I'm going in my mind and what we're doing clinically at the university. So the quaternary ammonium methacrylates, especially MDPB, which has been in our composite materials in uh, at an earlier time period, which were known to be antibacterial uh, in, in their mechanism. And they're mostly beneficial via the methacryl oil uh, uh, groups that are there. Say that three times fast. The MDPB uh, has been shown in this article by Arzu Tetragil Mutuale uh, to be used for years in our back in our overall dental capacity. Uh, but unfortunately, the benefits or the challenges associated have been shown to be mixed, and their inhibitory effect on the proteolytic activity may also be lost over time. And she indicated that they needed to really look at this to draw some more definitive conclusions as time goes by. So additional work was done. And in this article that cites Imazato, it studied the antimicrobial effectiveness of both water soluble and water insoluble MDPB based resin composites. And they found that there was an antibacterial effectiveness decreased after immobilization while that it was in the water insoluble had little acti antibacterial activity at all. So even though that had promise, the overall benefit is not shown to be long-term. Additional work has also been done on quaternary ammonium methacryloxy, uh, and that methacryloxy silicate materials also known as the Quamsy materials. And in this study that was done, they actually show that it was a very nice validated mechanism, which ex ex exhibited nice antibacterial properties. So this was in an acrylic based material. And that, by, that was a really nice activity that went on. So this opened up some of the floodgates to the development of potentially additional antibacterial composite restorations, perhaps. That also, this is the, and one of the possible uh, developments was this quasi-molecule, which are non-soluble uh, quaternary ammonium silica dioxide molecules, which have a high concentration of the residue from the quaternary ammonium, which is covalently bonded to a silica core, similar to a standard composite filler. That's great. And it's incorporated into the materials to become part of the polymerized composite, as we do with our existing polymerized, uh, existing filler particles in our composites. And according to this, the information provided, the antibacterial effect is not dependent on release, but instead as it becomes in contact with the bacteria, which is what Cliff was talking about in the sealant material that he created with the K18. And of course, it's been commercialized by Nauno Bio into a composite, a universal bond, and a flowable composite that is currently available. But if you take a look at the, at the company's website, you start to look at cost. And unfortunately, the cost for these materials and the shade selection is very limited, and the cost is quite high. And that's something that you as a clinician may take into account as you're working with it. But this might have possible solution to what needs to be done or what is trying to be done. So as I did a little bit more investigation into the products, I did stumble upon the article that basically shows what this 
quasi nanoparticle can do. And in the study, it talks about the results. They talk about the conclusion that that study show that the composites with the quasi antibacterial particles significantly reduced demineralization in enamel uh, to, to quite ex an extent in the gap between where the material was done. And this is an in situ test, meaning that they have them put into uh, healthy people's mouths and basically they warm for a period of time to try to create a natural model rather than a laboratory model as Cliff does, does in his work. Uh, and again, the small number of people as they talk about in the clinical relevance and also the limitations of the study showed that even though it was sufficiently powered, it's unclear how the magnitude of differences in demineralization in this study translate into the incidence of secondary caries reduction. And as such, the product essentially showed that it could only demineral prevent demineralization and not be antibacterial. And as the various 510K FDA approvals will show that the universal composite, the flowable composite, and the bulk fill material can only be claimed demineralization reduction and not antibacterial reduction at this point in time. They need to do more studies to be more effective in that. So that's something that you can put into your into your back pocket and work with as time goes by if that product seems to be beneficial or something that you're interested in using. But in our, in our school and in my work that I've been doing, we've been looking more at the quaternary ammonium silane materials instead, which is the combination of the tetraethoxysilane K21 with the quaternary ammonium silane QAS backbone, as Cliff described in his slides earlier. So this material has been shown to be very nice antibacterial because of its lipophilic alkyl chain, which enables a penetration through the bacterial walls of the cell uh, of the bacteria that come in contact with it, creating an uh, autolysis or killing on contact without dispersing into the oral cavity. And it also has demonstrated a very nice anti-MMP activity meaning that bond strengths and the reduction of potential breakdown from the proteolytic activity is quite good. And a lot of studies have been shown and been used uh, in, in following up on this. One of them in particular shows that the antibacterial, tr uh, antimicrobial triggers uh, of the bacterial uh, membrane are present. And it showed in this, in this study that is a very potent antibacterial disinfectant and plaque inhibitor, which is something that we need because we want to reduce that biofilm from accumulating on the mouth, especially the dysbiotic biofilm. Additionally, we're also very concerned with cytotoxicity. As Cliff showed in some of his things, the PMMAs, possibly because of the release of the various uh, 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 materials within it that were not fully cured, became quite toxic. But when this study by Dr. Daoud showed that basically it had no cytotoxic effects of this K21 product on any of the cells that they tested, that puts you at, my, at ease as well and puts me at ease in knowing that we have something that I can use that is going to be beneficial while not problematic to the overall benefit. And again, over time, the bond strength does not deteriorate. Uh, which is also very, very exciting. As you can see, the control in both the two different bonding agents really significantly dropped over 12 months, while the, uh, the QAS 2% solution maintained it or even improved it over that 12 months of time period. So this K21 QS cavity cleaner has been designed to penetrate deep within the dentinal tubules by reducing the bacteria that we know to be associated with decay and being embedded into that dentin as we begin to restore it and perhaps enable us to cut down on some of that secondary decay or any kind of damage internally. It helps also to clear the restorative site of the caries debris and reduces the microbes. And as I said, 
penetrates deeply into the tubules for a stronger restorative adhesive result as we go forward. Also, in some of the studies that have been shown, it is also wonderful in keep killing the bacteria as compared to the control in this study, as compared to chlorhexidine, as compared to uh, uh, calcium hydroxide. And you can see the K21 in three days and in seven days is quite significant in the overall bacterial uh, reduction as shown with the amount of red as compared to green. Red indicates a lot of bacteria are dead. Green means that they would be alive. So that material is the fight back antimicter antimicrobial cavity cleaner. Um, we have been using this at the university for well over a year, and it's been very beneficial in many different ways. Um, we have had reduction in sensitivity postoperatively. Our, uh, you know, and students doing uh, dental work can sometimes be uh, sloppy, as we talked about earlier. Uh, this has helped to reduce that need to replace restorations at least over the course of the last year as frequently as we had to do it at previous time periods. And the 510K Fed, uh, FDA clearance shows that it is an antimicrobial as compared to a demineralization agent. So those are some differences between the two different commercial products that are available today. The overall application of it is really very simple. Uh, and we use this as part of our process. The IFU for uh, the fight back indicates that you want to uh, first total etch the tooth for about 10 to 15 seconds, wash it copiously, gently dry, and then apply the K21 product onto that liberally on the enamel and onto the dentin. And as it does that, it basically precipitates on the dentinal surface and then is redissolved because of its methacrylate uh, basis, it's able to dissolve down again in the ethanols or the acetones of our dentin adhesive materials and enable that material to come together with it, which creates a better interface and a better deeper bond into the dentinal tubules. So we've been very, very interested in that. And it is able to push the material deeper into the dentinal tubules as well to kill bacteria that may be present, as we saw on some of the micrographs earlier in this presentation. The other aspect that's really very interesting is that it reduces the interfacial permeability, meaning that the moisture that may otherwise have penetrated into the adhesive and into the, uh, the composite material doesn't have the ability to break down and hydrolytic breakdown is significantly reduced with the, the application of the K21 product. And also it reduces the uh, bacterial uh, uh, proteolytic enzyme breakdown, as you can see here in that the QAS has very little green in the zymograph as compared to the control and equal to or superior to that in the 2% chlorhexidine. So, could this methodology be the answer that we've been looking to? We want something that's gonna be anti-protease. We want something that's gonna be antibacterial. We want something that's gonna be biocompatible and something that is gonna create a stable bond. It's my belief, and so far from the things that we have seen at our clinical work, that this material is the direction that we've been looking for and offers a great deal of promise as we go forward. So if you have any additional questions after the overall presentations today, you can reach me at my email address, jcamisi at jcamisi.com. And of course, Dr. Carey, his email is a tranquility4007 at gmail.com. And we'll open it up to questions now. Dr. Kamisi, thank you so much for your excellent presentation and, and Dr. Carey again as well. And we do have some questions for you. I can go ahead and read those or you can also read along with me. Sure. Um, so in the chat area, you'll see the orange box with the two blue arrows down and we have moved all the questions to the public side there. The okay. first question is what, what are the factors that affected uh, for Carey's progress? Um, 
I think that that's probably something I can talk about. Those factors uh, were the four that I mentioned. The amount of acid uh, that's generated by biofilm is certainly one of them. Uh, the oral, the, the tooth itself as a substrate, uh, there are some people who have what are referred to as soft teeth and other with teeth that just seem extra hard. Um, that's not a scientific description, but it's a practical description. But the, there are differences between teeth. The other part of it is, is the um, as as you uh, look at a patient and you you start talking to them, find out that they eat a lot of sugary snacks during the daytime. All of that extra um, sugar, and that you know, one of the people asked about uh, whether I'm talking about just processed sugar or am I talking about uh, natural sugars, including fruits. Sugar is sugar as far as biofilm is concerned. It, it likes food. And uh, for the most part, uh, when I say sugars, I'm being inclusive of anything sweet. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would concur with that, Cliff. That's, that's really very important because uh, I use a slide in other presentations about patients coming in to tell me I have soft teeth. And again, are they really soft or is it just the environment in which they live? <laughs> so that's one of the challenges that we always are trying to deal with there. I, I'm uh, being generous and saying it's both. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I also will note, uh, and this is somewhat controversial, but things like xylitol, there are certain bacteria, especially after quorum sensing has come around, uh, that can actually metabolize slower, but even these, quote, non-fermentable sugar substitutes can actually be used by the bacteria. And it's very interesting what kind of acids come off of those metabolisms because they're not necessarily normal that we're used to. You know, the glycolysis gives us a nice idea of what we're supposed to expect, and then we see other things. But I think that's a really, that's a really important point. I, I did not know that. So, again, you've taught me something again. Yeah, well, <laughs> hang around. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who may not uh, know, uh, Dr. Kamisi and I go back a few years, and we actually got together talking about these kinds of things uh, while we were having a beverage. And I can just say that the conversations are always special because – our points of view are quite different, um, and uh, it's, it's where our best discussions are is at the interface between practice and theory. Definitely. <laughs> so thank there, you, <laughs> There is a question here, and I think you addressed this already, Dr. Carey, about uh, types of sugar and, and so forth. The next question, are a person's biofilm established for the rest of their life by the age of one to two years old? In parentheses, they have possibly old info that I was taught. Um, I'm going to say the the biofilm, the, the, the fact that there is biofilm is early, yes, but it certainly changes its characteristics throughout life, um, depending on a lot of different things. I've I think I em emphasize the idea of the environment of the mouth and the biofilm response to that. Just as a, a really great example, as somebody who's getting a little bit older and maybe starting to take, um, say, blood pressure medication or something like that, the, that affects the salivary flow and even some of the composition of the saliva itself in terms of the proteins and inter, uh, stuff. And... I'm just going to say that the saliva, uh, that the biofilm that's there also changes, sometimes beneficially if you clean up and get rid of all of the sugary sweets, um, uh, you starve out some of the more uh, sugar-dependent acid producers, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, uh, so so <clears throat> that's a long answer for saying no. A person's biofilm is not established exactly at birth or two, two years. It to changed. add on to that, if I could, <laughs> you. Us, if you don't mind in interrupting again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Also, interestingly enough, the pellicle formation, which you talked about, is very important for the overall biofilm that is developed 
there. And again, a higher carbohydrate environment will certainly create a different pellicle versus a higher protein type, which basically could be more beneficial. But interestingly enough, mouthwashes and toothpaste with all kinds of stuff in it have also been kind of indicated in some studies to change the pellicle in a way that it also creates more of an interestingly potentially dysbiotic uh, oral uh, biofilm as well. Thank you. I just learned something about that. I didn't know that rinses could do that. Yeah, I'll send you the article. I think you'll find it fascinating. <laughs> There's a question here from Dr. Kimen Wang. Uh, PMMA, PMMA is also a polymer similar to composite resin. Any idea why it did not support microbial growth in multi-species experiment as much as composite? I believe he answered that because Cliff answered that and then Kuman put in that, thanks for answering the question right after it. <laughs> there it is, okay. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that everybody else um, heard it, so. Right, just in case you didn't hear it, the PMMA was not fully polymerized. And so there was uh, toxic methyl methacrylate still able to diffuse from the substrate and that will kill bacteria, as it turns out. And that goes to the degree of conversion problems as well. Yeah. Because if the composite, again, we think that when we put a composite into the mouth, that it is fully polymerized. Well, at best, maybe it's 65% completely converted. There's still a lot of resin, unfilled resin floating around in there. And so that's where a lot of uh, cytotoxic studies have been done and shown so, you know, again, what, what Kuman's re referring to and what, what Cliff has been talking about is that our materials are problematic. And if we don't use them properly, um, it's going to create an issue. Um, John, I want you to know that I was one of the people who was curing those samples. It sure looked finished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't. And we found out later by actually doing an extraction and saw that there was some MMA still there. Right. And again, it comes back to lights as well. Oh, if yeah. your light isn't curing effectively and you don't know it, you're also going to create more free monomer than you have activated monomer in the area there. So that's why, as I indicated, light curing is, is an, a critical component of everything that we do because it also is going to be a weaker composite uh, if it's not cured properly. And if you don't get that degree of conversion, it becomes a real big issue as well. So there's a lot of factors that many clinicians don't take into, into, uh, into their knowledge base or into consideration when they're restoring things. We do find that indirect uh, composite restorations have a higher degree of conversion than do our direct composite materials. We have a, a product related question. Do we want to just hold on to that for Dr. Kimmerling's presentation? It's around take home and cost. How do you feel about that? I'm pretty sure that Dr. Kimmerling is going to be discussing that when, when we get to that point. Okay. Uh, and again, we've been, we've been using it at the college. Uh, and again, it, uh, you know that colleges are always on a very fine budgetary constraint. So uh, if, if, it, if, it were, if it were extraordinarily costly, uh, the college would not be incorporating it into its use. So I can, I can let you know it's not ridiculous. So right there. Another question from Dr. Wang, etiology of secondary caries. How about the fact that composite is a surface that bacteria like? Wouldn't a higher bacteria biofilm attachment enhance the change for secondary caries? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, anything that allows, uh, that encourages the biofilm to accumulate and grow and thrive is going to have an effect overall, I believe, on the chance of developing secondary carriers. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Groner would like to know what about glass ionomer bases? Um, not entirely sure what that what that is. We tested it uh, for whether or not it uh, it, it can it, uh, biofilms will form on it, and we found they do. And again, bonding to a glass ionomer base also becomes problematic from the clinician standpoint. 
So you, from a practical point of view, um, it's not easy to bond to a glass ionomer. Um, there is that uh, interface that does not join and could create a, 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 a space separation over time, uh, which we kind of see with, uh, especially when we're, we're looking at uh, uh, sandwich techniques that are, were very popular for a long time. Again, from Dr. Groner, any studies after ozone applied to the caries? <laughs> Interesting. So uh, certainly I've heard of the ozone um, um, angle and I have not tested any myself, so I can't answer that. So we, also, <laughs> we, also we also have a problem with ozone being um, accepted in the US as readily as it is in Canada and other countries, I think too. So that becomes an issue. Question from Dr. Schaefen, what effect does the etch have on the bacteria in the dentin tubules? Evidently not a lot. <laughs> 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 because if it did, it would stop it. Again, the, the etchant can't really penetrate as deeply as to where the bacteria are located, uh, but the K21 product is able to uh, deeply penetrate. So I'm, I have a higher confidence with the utilization of the K21 than I am uh, just etchant alone. I'm going to point out that the etchants and the bacteria itself, although it takes a little bit of time, they can sometimes um, turn into a spore type of situation where they protect themselves from an unfriendly environment. Um, doesn't mean it happens right away, but at the same time, if you're looking at a longer term uh, where the adhesive um, etchant um, slowly approaches deeper into the tubules, it might, in fact, find that the bacteria has put up a guard. Interesting. This I don't is... have evidence for that. <laughs> that's, an inter that's an interesting point, and that's something that, again, we forget that these microbes are pretty darn smart. They're mm -hmm. trying to protect themselves as much as possible. So if you, if they can create the spore or go into a dormant stage for a period of time, once any kind of opening develops, uh, then, we, then we can have a problem again. This is a question from Tracy. Other than the adjunct therapies you speak of, are there better composites to use to resist biofilm and help in caries management, or are they all the same? <laughs> it's an excellent question and very open to a lot of debate. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that not all composites are created equal. Correct. Um, <laughs> what I can also say is that all composites do seem to support biofilm unless there's something special done to them by uh, like putting a, uh, the K21 or the K18 into the mix. The, um, um, and give it time those that uh, may have um, some active ingredients that diffuse away, and I think Dr. Uh, that John talked about this, that, that if your antimicrobial goes away after a while, like in chlorhexidine, then you lost that capability. And so then you, whatever that surface is, is now able to support biofilm. So yeah. I'm going to say not all are created equal, but they all do seem to, to some extent, uh, accumulate biofilm. Yeah. I, even I, tried, I even tried Teflon <laughs> and it grew biofilm. <laughs> That's interesting. And again, I'm, I'm a big fan of some of the uh, non-traditional composites. I've been in that camp for a number of years. Uh, I think that if a material has something to bring to the game that can be beneficial, either in trying to reduce demineralization or trying to enhance the overall uh, reduction of, of the bacteria that's present, we're in good shape. But if it leaches uh, the antibacterial, that becomes an issue in my mind. If you're, if you're releasing calcium and phosphates from a, uh, a, a thing, or if that material is contained in there, or even strontium, as some composites do nowadays, uh, I see a benefit there. I don't see a a downside, but will it be better long-term? Uh, that's something we'd have to play with in the lab, I think. 
question about um, is this strictly to be used with composites or can it also be used with amalgam? According to the IFU, it is, is specifically for your resin materials, so whether it's a resin cement, cementing on a crown, putting on a provisional, uh, doing a direct composite restoration, doing an in indirect composite restoration. Under amalgam, we're, we're still using glutaraldehyde as our initial uh, cavity cleanser and, uh, and killer of bacteria. But we, because we know that over the course of time, the silver of the amalgam is going to help with the antibacterial activity as Cliff showed, but the IFU does not indicate that you use the K21 product uh, underneath the amalgam because you have to etch before time to open up the dental tubules and you don't etch on the amalgam preparations. From uh, Treveni, can fire back, I'm assuming this is fight back, can fight back be used in place of Gluma? At what stage of the prep is it applied and do we air thin it? Right. No, you don't air thin it. Basically, the IFU for the product and what we use at the university is we, after you prep your tooth and you have everything cleared and, and ready to go, etch the tooth for 10 to 15 seconds, wash and gently dry, apply the fight back, the K21 fight back material to all surfaces of the preparation. Then immediately you can then place on the bonding agent. If you want to air thin it, you can, but I find that because of the ethanol solution that it's in, the ethanol dissolves and dissipates rather rapidly. So by the time they get their bonding agent in there, it's already been, it's already dry and ready to go. And then you put your bonding agent onto it. It interfaces with the K21 material nicely. It's, and then once you cure that bonding agent, it, it basically dual cures everything back together again, and then restore your typical, whatever composites or restoration that you want to do. And that's, that's the protocol. So it's instead of using the uh, chlorhexidine or the gluma in that stage, you'd use the K21 product after etching and washing and drying and before your bonding agent. Question from Dr. Wang again, would the pellicle interfere with the efficacy of K18 since it is contact <clears throat> mediated? You want a clean tooth <laughs> before you do anything. I think that's that's pro that's paramount. That's one of the things that we teach the students is before you start your preparation, before you start doing anything, clean the darn thing with flour pumice before you you do anything else. Well, and in I would our, think you do it also in our clinical trial where we use the K18 sealant around the brackets, we had etched the whole surface of the tooth first, then we put on the K18 uh, or UDMA, cured it and then uh, attach the bracket. So I think that we had disrupted the pellicle and I wouldn't, uh, but now when you get to the K21 that we put on into in our plaque study in that clinical trial, we did not remove the pellicle. We just brushed the teeth really well and we still had an effect. So the K21, uh, we don't know how long it lasts, but we do know that it had an effect that we saw at the end of 30 days. So uh, the short answer is, is I don't have a good answer for that question. It's a great question. And um, our research seems to, seems to, um, say that at least on the short term, like 30 days, maybe doesn't matter so much. I would still want to clean the tooth thoroughly, personally. And from the <laughs> clinical point of view, yeah, from the you know, we're, steps we're, we're, going we're, through Cliff, I'd we're, say we're, clean the dang tooth before you restore it. <laughs> well, this was this was only just that uh, we were trying to use the K21 itself as a, if you will, a shield or a surface treatment. And um, you know, we know that the less you have to manipulate the tooth the, and the better it will be. So slap the stuff on there, see if it has an effect and then go from there. We'll optimize but, it later. <laughs> but, 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 but remember, all dentists will only hear part of what you just said. So <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so please, for the audience, follow appropriate protocol in the restorative process so that this way you can maximize your benefit long term. Question from Dr. Coco, same bonding issues with dentin substitute materials? That's an interesting, not sure what that means. Same bonding issues with dentin substitute materials. Uh, dentin substitute materials could be considered uh, you know, anything. Uh, 
MTA is a dentin substitute material. Glass ionomer could be theoretically be considered a, 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 a dentin substitute material. So again, you, you have to be a little bit more specific. I'm sorry, I, I need more un information before that can be answered appropriately, I think. Okay. Uh, question from Dr. Groner. If glass ionomer releases fluoride underneath the composite and you get a tight seal to enamel, does the space matter? The interdiffusion zone, which is set up by the ion exchange in glass ionomer, is certainly a beneficial one. Uh, but again, uh, at this point in time, we're not using the K21 product under a glass ionomer, at least from my knowledge for the instructions for use. And I, I try to follow the IFU in all products. So right now, uh, if you're putting in a GI into an area, follow the GI instructions. I think you'd be safe in that capacity. We have a couple more questions that are product related, and I wanted to remind everybody um, at the top of the hour, Dr. Kimmerling will come on and will provide information specifically about the products and cost and so forth. So we invite you to stay for that portion. There is a question about isolation from Dr. Nyhoff. You spoke about isolation. What are your thoughts when you compare the isolite with the rubber dam? Basically, I'm a, bit, I'm a fan of the Isovac isolites, uh, isolation uh, thing. We use that at the college as well, uh, simply because you're, you're getting the patient to relax and bite gently onto it while they're working. It's removing all kinds of uh, saliva, basically under, under, under a rubber dam. You sometimes get the swamp developing. Uh, so uh, we, we advocate both of those. Our students like the isolite better. Uh, than the rubber dam, but they need to know how to use, place rubber dam properly for board examinations. So uh, we use both. Uh, and I, in my private practice, I use the isolite uh, predominantly for most, if not all, of my procedures. We have a question about silver nanoparticles reinforced uh, composite. And this is from Dr. El Bejo. I can tell you that we've looked at that um, in particular. And interestingly, uh, the silver nanoparticles are those that are on the very surface of the composite may have a, a, an effect, but they tend to oxidize away and you end up not getting um, a uh, uh, fresh silver um, nanoparticles coming out, um, being, being effective. I'm not saying it had no effect, I'm just saying that what we saw was that we could still, um, we saw biofilm on some of those, some of those composites that, that we had to test. And um, I'm going to also tell you that I'm not going to go to bat uh, saying they're not as effective. We just looked at it and moved on. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's the answer on the nanoparticles. Can I go back and there was a question I saw that we didn't ask and it had to do with iodine? Correct. And, and I just wanted to point out that although iodine is a very, very um, popular um, antimicrobial, uh, it, it rinses away over time. And so you don't get the lasting effect that what we're talking about is important. And I thought, to, I thought John actually um, described it better than I did. So that iodine uh, and ozone both are temporary and quite honestly, um, um, what you need on the short term is not always the same as what you want on the long term. That uh, question about molecular iodine, we have one of the founders on our platform. So I think that they may have been familiar with that presentation too. Um, let me double check. I think we reached one yeah, more one here point. on silver diamine fluoride as a carries a resting agent. And then there's one about acid etching and sound detin. You, you want to do the SDF? I'll do SDF for, I'll start, I'll start the SDF. SDF is, is quite remarkable. It's got so much silver in there that even when it does start dissolving away, it's got a big reservoir that takes years for it to, uh, to, to properly to dissolve, dissolve away. 
I have not tried uh, it. And, and, and oh, by the way, um, you wouldn't put it onto a tooth um, uh, that doesn't have any rest, uh, any indication of, of demineralization because the silver diamine fluoride really doesn't absorb into teeth uh, that are not, don't have holes in them. And so as a prevention uh, uh, thing, we actually did run a study and presented it at the late uh, last IADR meeting. And it, we found that it does prevent um, uh, erosive loss when you do a quick, quick erosion test. This was all in vitro. Um, but we also found that, that it really didn't take up all that much. And we don't know if it was the fluoride or the silver that did this. And, and so that, that's the other part. Silver diamine fluoride um, clinically is usually used to um, uh, arrest caries. And, and so what you have there is, is um, uh, silver accumulating in places where there's caries to be released over time. And I don't think we have really long-term stuff, but we do know that it's very effective at killing the bacteria. That was a circular answer. Yeah, it, it worked. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and you get the, the, last the, ac the acid etching of sound dentin. Uh, I think that it goes back to one of the slides that I presented in that most of the studies that we do or most of the manufacturers uh, from a standards point of view uh, they use shear bond strength with uh, caries free teeth typically to show how strong their bond is but you and i don't necessarily work on non-carious teeth so your bond strength decreases on caries affected dentin and so the reality is is that if you're expecting 32 megapascals from a bonding agent on a caries affected tooth that you've just finished getting uh, all of the, uh, the 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 k out of you may not get 32 you make it significantly less, but incorporating the K21, you're going to do two things. You're going to reduce the bacterial content, you're gonna clean the tooth, and you're gonna enhance your bond strength. So basically, from a restorative doctor's point of view, that's the way I would go, personally. Um, before I would go away, all the way away from silver diamine fluoride, the question yeah. is, any thoughts on SDF as a caries arresting agent? It certainly does work. And our university uses it appropriately, mm -hmm. but not, not everywhere. Right, ours too. Terrific. Well, we have reached the top of the hour here. I'd like to thank you both for tremendous presentations. Um, I know that the audience really appreciates it. I also want to express our gratitude to Fight Back Dental for providing this presentation today. Uh, we have a presentation by Dr. Kimmerling now, and it is product related. We do have a banner at the top of the screen for you. So I would urge you to tap on that banner if you want to learn more about Fight Back Dental. And thank you, Dr. Kamisi and Dr. Carey. Anything you'd like to say, Dr. Kimmerling, before we go towards uh, your presentation? Yes, I uh, truly want to thank you, uh, Dental CE Academy and these two wonderful gentlemen that are uh, it presented very well and is the cutting edge of what we need to have for dentistry today. So I want to thank both of them as well. Very well. I'm we'll going to go ahead and uh, introduce Dr. Kimmerling. Anything else you wanted to say, Dr. Kimmerling? Nope. We're ready nope. to roll. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's All right. Friday afternoon. It is Friday afternoon. So again, I want to remind everybody that this presentation, Dr. Kimmerling is going to talk to you about fight back technology in more detail and answer those questions that we saw earlier. There is a banner at the top of the screen. We'll also include the link. You have this presentation in the course handout. And again, that link is in the chat area. I'll repost that. I would like to go ahead now and introduce Dr. Kim Kimmerling. Dr. Kirk Kimmerling completed an undergraduate degree at Emory University in chemistry and continued on at Emory for his dental degree. He is currently researching dental materials with universities, researchers, and corporations to improve the quality of dental care. 
He is an expert dentist when it comes to dental materials. He is the founder and chief architect at Fight Back Dental, a company incorporating antimicrobial technology and material science into dental products. So Dr. Kimmerling, I will direct the virtual podium to you. Thank you for being here. And we'll go ahead and address the questions here at the end. Well, wonderful. And thank you all for attending. I want to try to make this as quick as possible. And we're basically the fight back technology is more gearing now for regenerative medicine. So I want to kind of alert you to the fact that the um, CE Academy will, the next session will be August 18th with Dr. Umar Dayu. And I really want to encourage everyone to attend this. This is the, um, the basics of what we're getting to in regenerative medicine, not just for dentistry, for all medicine. And the direction that we've taken this is to the genetic levels. So in this presentation, I'll quickly get to some of that and then uh, give you more of the uh, antimicrobial dentistry. Microbes are everywhere from 126,000 feet up in the stratosphere to 26,000 feet below the Earth's surface. Microbes are in us, our nose, our mouth, our gut. They are part of a symbiotic relationship that makes up our microbiome. When uncontrolled, however, they can harm us, leading to painful, life-limiting, and life-altering chronic conditions like tooth decay. In fact, tooth decay is the most prevalent chronic disease in humans worldwide. Even when addressed by professionals, residual decay in microbes can be left in a repaired tooth, and that can lead to additional complications. Well, thanks for watching that video. So yes, they are, and they fall off us. There's a cloud around us. We actually transfer DNA into the air, and we're talking about viruses as well. And in fact, there's probably about a thousand bacteria per milliliter in our blood right now. And there's over 300 trillion viral particles in us as we see at this stage. The thing I'm bringing here is that the Enterococcus buccalis is thriving in macrophages. We're finding now that this is Dr. Frank Tay, who is the father of modern antimicrobial uh, dentistry. His colleagues uh, have worked hard at all the things that we have accomplished in this realm of fight back technologies. And no, understanding that we're trying to treat something and then sometimes even our own immune system fails to uh, satisfy our problems in this um, bacterial assault. This company is built on and derived from more than 45 international dental research scientists. We have 25 publications and we have more clinical trials. We have two completed and we're closer to regenerative medicine to a point of uh, it, I think by the end of the summer, we'll have astonishing things to show the world. So we're patented worldwide. We have FDA clearances and we have ongoing research. That really kind of brings us to the forefront of we are built in authority. These people that put all this together, all these scientists now are the direction that we will go to have antimicrobial dentistry for the future. This slide here is trying to bring forth as Dr. Chris Cutler had put sutures with the K21 on it. The slide to the left is the, um, this is in showing a, um, the zone of inhibition in the bacteria around that slide, uh, around the suture. And the reason I'm bringing this to point is that we have found that the K21 has this quorum sensing and is sending a message out to other bacteria. And I mean a lot of bacteria. And we found fungus and there's other evidence supporting that maybe a antiviral component to this quorum sensing. And that it's sending messages to adjacent bacteria to die and candida as well, but we do know. So when we place this material, we find that this is how this K21 ruptures but the next presentation by Dr. Dayu will explain more of what we have found now. We've identified the quorum sensing as well as the other mechanisms of just not this puncturing of the microbial membrane. 
This is actually something he'll show also. We we know to locate this K21 because it we we know that it forms a bit of a precipitate. So this is just a kind of a slide I threw in here just to kind of show you how in depth that we are in working with the K21 in obviously the macrophage where we're finding the um, information. So this is another um, biofilm destructive layers, uh, courtesy of Dr. Frank Tay, where we're showing this quorum sensing. So the contact of the K18 on the material is making this send these messages in these cell to cell interactions of quorum sensing to kill adjacent microbes. Just a little slide there. This is another slide that I kind of stole from Dr. <clears throat> Franklin Tay is because we do know in some of the healing, um, the, in the studies that we're currently doing of wound healing, that these MMPs have been shown to accelerate wound healing when you're inhibiting these MMPs, and that's in the literature. This, um, some of the information that you'll see with Dr. Day, if we can um, have everyone participate, because all this is, is uh, deep knowledge based, just one of the uh, studies that has been done. So this is a quick overview of what we've seen. The K21 has this significant immunomodulatory properties. It's highly anti-inflammatory. It polarizes these macrophages from an, from an M1 inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory. These things we've now discovered that it's uh, fragmenting the mitochondria, inducing macrophage um, phaging, that we're seeing acceleration of wound healing. So, the K21 is now in a path in, in this specialty of wound healing and other aspects that we think that we'll be able to, to announce to the public by the end of the summer. So we're not in there just telling something. We have histological evidence. We actually into this now single cell transcriptomics and that we'll be able to prove everything that we're doing with these genetic uh, markers in the upregulation and downregulation specific genes. So where it really began right here, this is the um, inventor, Dr. Franklin Tay. Again, he is the father of antimicrobial dentistry because these are the things that we do know work. And you probably saw from the other gentleman before me how well this stuff does do for our restoration. Gently shake the bottle for two to four seconds just before use. It's best to dispense the cavity cleanser directly into a dapping dish. From here, the cleanser can be applied with a micro brush or a cotton pellet. And here we are dropping the cleanser onto a disposable mirror. After gently drying the mirror, the evaporation of the aqueous ethanolic solution leaves the remaining active ingredient K21 forming a sticky gel-like layer. Once applied and rubbed into the moist prepared dentin, the cleanser will react with the water to form a nanoprecipitate that penetrates dentinal tubules and paratubular dentin, which becomes a stable layer of K21. K21 has been Well, that was kind of a repeat of what um, Dr. Kamisi showed, but in fact, this is really the uh, pathway that we need. We need to stop these microbes. And again, as we go to the next slide, where Dr. Kamisi shows you these spherical things are kind of like what we're seeing inside the tooth. But again, we found out they're disassociating from those globules as well. And the penetration of that quorum sensing is even deeper. So which will be discussed with Dr. Dayu in the uh, presentation on the 18th of August. So what we have is some people refer to as the Holy Grail. Can we find something that could work better than this? At this stage, we don't see this. And again, that when we are talking about the previous issues of the reparative process and the odontoblasts, that we're finding more of these uh, really interesting properties of this. And again, this is the biofilm destructive capabilities, the anti-inflammatories. So these things and accelerating reparative process again these are the things that we could potentially see in our dentin bond that we're putting it on a biological process the reason why we brought this first 
thing out is we, as a dentist of practicing 41 years, that this product does solve our problem. It does help because we're not working with the old body. We're working in a tiny little environment. That little environment we can now control. We can remove the decay. We can place this uh, antimicrobial bond, uh, uh, cavity cleanser onto the surface, rendering this surface now fixed antimicrobial and showing you before that it's penetrating deeper inside the tooth in killing the microbes that are deeper into that area. There are other products that make certain claims, but this over time will show, be shown to be regenerative in the facts that we can eventually show the FDA how well this does work on the living structure of the dentin. So thank you for listening to me concerning some of the exciting news that we have on the horizon with wound care, healing, various various medical devices that we've now incorporated K21 into and that we can foresee to have them available for the medical profession sometime next year. So we are having a um, pricing for the attendees today. And this is just the code that you will have to go in there to get the, the proper discounts for this. And again, this is not an expensive material to use. And in fact, as, a, as I practice, we basically basically a drop on the, the brush and rub that brush and that one drop into the dentin of the tooth. You might use a couple drops, um, but I'm trying to teach you how to conserve the material, rub it on the enamel in the dentin, much like Dr. Kamisi explained. And again, I don't do much of that either in a sense of uh, air drying it. We, we even though we recommend it, put your bond agent of choice in and place that over top of the cavity cleanser and rub deeply. The slide I showed before is drying the, the uh, ethanol away was to kind of show people that there's really something in the bottle. And that layer is how pronounced you, you can see it, you know how much you're gonna be putting on the dentin of the tooth. So, the best technology for antimicrobial dentistry is here. It's there. It's the interface, the part that we are designed to try to treat the most of. And yes, we have other products on the um, on the pathway for FDA clearances, which will then provide these filling materials and everything else that we have. But it will only appear till next year. But this is what we need to use now. This is the this is the secret sauce. Put it on your fillings. Are they going to work? Well, you saw the experts. We are the built-in authority on this antimicrobial dentistry. So thank you very much for attending both of these two hours and listening to me. Dr. Kimberly, we have some questions and some comments. This one is from uh, Dr. Groner. Before I go to those questions, I want to remind everyone there are quite a few of you. If you go to the banner at the top of the screen, we do have a promo code available. And if you purchase two bottles, you'll receive a 50% discount. Um, so take a look at that. And the question here from Dr. Groner is about ozone. K21 acts very much as ozone does. You guys should study. Um, any comments about that? Well, I, I just don't have any comments. Don't know enough about it. I, I mean, the, the, when we have um, the interaction on the mitochondria, okay, so we're understanding that we're working on a biological system. So I'm not talking about cavity cleanser. I'm talking about K21 in the biological processes. When this thing goes into the cells, the way that we've been able to to we call artificial fission of the mitochondria. We have compared it to other things like chlorhexidine. In these degradations of when the mitochondria, how it works, it produces reactive oxygen species. So if we're putting ozone to a cell, that's not what we want. That's the thing that damages the mitochondria the most. So I don't know enough about the ozone layer and putting it into a biological system 
Um, so I just can't comment on that. Um, I'm just going to mention that although K21 is a contact antimicrobial, uh, the idea with that is that you put it onto the surface and then the bugs that come in contact with it end up being killed. The ozone is something that is um, basically rinsed into the system um, either by water or by gas, but usually by water at a low concentration. And it has a very um, relatively short um, residence time and that it gets cleared out uh, within within hours. So the, the other part of that is that the K21 is much more persistent and the ozone less so. Question about um, etchin strength after air abrasion. And I think that may have been left from prior, but perhaps you could address that and um, the information currently. We haven't sure. tried that in, in the clinic, so I don't know. Do you have any knowledge on that, Kirk or, or Cliff? I could comment on it. I, I mean, I uh, have used it in the past, in, even acid etch. So um, it's been quite some while. The, the cavity cleanser does remove debris. So if you go into the dentin of the tooth and rubbing it in there, according to Dr. Franklin Tay, that this does, it removes that smear layer. It almost acts as well as the phosphoric acid that we use. It takes a little more effort, but it does work. It's very acidic, but the stability of the MMPs are, uh, are uh, significant. Any other questions? I see quite a few went to the information um, on your landing page, Dr. Kimmerling. Is there any here that we're looking at? Well, I'll answer them later if we need to. Question from Dr. Nehoff, would K21 help if decayed? I think it's... Can you clarify that a little bit more, Dr. Niehoff? And it's nice to see you again. She attends lots of our courses, so she's well, a mobile provider. We should, we should remove decay, active decay. What we see, if, if it looks discolored, it's not due to the tooth naturally, even though it could be with tetracycline or something like that. But you, you need to remove decay. That's pretty much what Dr. Kamisi said. And when you're on that pulpal, area there um you know we, we 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 find that we can help the situation but we can't make those claims through the fda at this process and i don't think i'm going to go back to the fda and say hey we can put this on carious lesions i think the idea is to remove it to a point where you feel comfortable and that we do feel uh, that it's effective into a carious area in killing the pathogens that are in there yeah, at this point in time, you definitely want to remove the decay from the area and then, you know, make sure that you have sound structure to restore to. Um, you know, we can get into discussions on vital pulp therapy, et cetera, but I think that's another story and another lecture. <laughs> Any comment on the use of uh, tubule sid red in removing the smear layer? There has been some indication that the tubulicid red actually uh, has an effect on the long-term bonding strength. So that's why we don't use that any longer. Um, so. Okay. And I wanna remind everybody too that the um, this presentation is available for you. We did record this. So everyone will receive access to the recording here shortly and Please type in your questions if you have any. Question, is it time to buy stock in your product? 
yesterday. Well, <laughs> let's let's um, you know if, if you really want to hang around for a couple more minutes. This is an exciting time in medicine. This thing that we have created is a drug application, and these people, where we're not just dentistry, we have dozens and dozens of researchers right now throughout the world working on interesting stuff. So uh, please be August this 18th. You'll see some of this at the beginning of what we already have and what we'll prove. So when you go to, uh, we'll have things that will cure everything in the oral cavity. Okay, I'll tell you by 2025, you'll put things in periodontal pockets, they disappear, bone grows back. You have sutures that accelerate wound healing. We 3D printed collagen, we 3D printed bone with, with K21 in it. It enhances the bone, it, it grows faster, bigger. Okay, so it'll be the thing of the future put on dental implants. So I can't say to do that, but since I'm the, um, you know, that's, just Not something that we're around the corner to tell everybody <laughs> it's going to change everything in dentistry. And those things that uh, Clifton Carey has already uh, done with the UDMA, see, we'll have these things available by next year. Many of the products. So you want to invest in, in, in um, fight back, there may be an opportunity in the future. I want to jump in, Dr. Kimmerling, and just make a mention as a public health dentist, which I am, I was the chief for the Office of Oral Health here for Maricopa County uh, for some time. Some of you know my story, but last year I was a dental patient. I had composites that looked just like Dr. Comisi um, showed, but my story didn't work out so well. Um, I fractured one of those and ended up needing an extraction and an antibiotic and ended up with C. diff. So we have to, and it almost killed me. So we have to think about in terms of how can we reach these teeth before it progresses to something. Um, and uh, this is why I find the technology so fascinating because we do have an opportunity here to treat the teeth locally before something becomes worse. And the next thing you know, we're prescribing antibiotics and putting someone in the hospital, which is what happened to me four times. So um, I'm I'm really very, very excited about this technology. And uh, I've had numerous conversations with Dr. Kimmerling about it and biomaterials was my thing at UCSF. So um, I'm really excited to have you all here today. And I think you've done a tremendous service for our audience today and, and our future audience. And I hope that we can provide these exceptional, exceptional continuing education courses, which I think every dental school should be, you know, mandatory for the students to be uh, attending or re re uh, reviewing the recordings that have been made. So our next next few lectures that we have on these new cutting edge technology will be the dominant force in the future for dentistry. But we need to get this thing out. Now I want to thank Clifton Carey and John Camisi so much for their excellent presentations because these are things that I learned a lot too from Cliff every time I talk to him. And these are our experts. I, you know, Clifton Carey is our Carey's expert for the ADA. So we're we're here telling you not that we're bioactive and this is how it works. This is exactly how it works this is the genetics but behind it and some of that will be translated in the next ce and then the subsequent ce's will give you this is inarguable the evidence that support everything we do to the genetic level so we're going from the fda with these processes it's not like maybe or we don't know how it works it's this is exactly how it works to the genetic level so that's why we have this built-in authority and these two gentlemen with me today are our authorities in dentistry today thank you very much thank you so much and i want to remind everybody that the next presentation is august the 18th with dr umar daud and we have already sent out the email to all of you i think my assistant sent it out about 15 minutes ago you'll see the invitation also in your handout so be sure to register for that Thank you all for being here today. And it is an exciting time in dentistry. 
And we hope to see you all back here very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all.